Alrighty, it's still Wednesday. I'm going to put up a second video. This will probably be the last. Again, I encourage you to read chapter 23. I'm not getting enough stuff in here, but we got like two days left in the semester. I got to wrap it up. So I'll post this video. That'll be up tomorrow. Read the chapter. I'll probably put the exam up tomorrow as well, but I'll run it through probably Monday. You got to do it by Monday. I've got to do your grades. Other than that, uh, we're more or less done, as shabby as it was. Uh, for those of you that graduated, congratulations. Uh, for those of you that got into programs, I know Haley got into radi radiography, congratulations. Hopefully the fall semester will be a little bit back on track. All I'm going to finish with today is just look a little bit at that loop of Henley I skipped earlier. And... Uh, just show how you can produce a concentrated urine, look a little bit at the juxtaglomerular apparatus, just because I like that word, it's kind of cool, and uh, we'll, just, we'll just call it a semester. Uh, make sure you wrap up all of the Learn Smarts. I think I've extended a few of them. Let me know if you want them a couple more days, but get everything done, then I can just calculate your final grade. I'll try and post it on Blackboard. I don't know if I can get the letter grade on Blackboard, but I'll put the percentage up there and just say final percentage. Email me if you have a question or if something looked completely wonky. Um, and yeah, all right. And it's a good thing my paint's about shot on this wall again. I don't want to paint it again. So we have, you know, a Bowman's capsule. I'll make a little one here, a little Bowman's capsule. There we go. Proximal convoluted tubule. What we're going to emphasize is the loop of Henley. I'm exaggerating it a wee bit. And then this will convoluted tubule. And down this way. Up this way. And there. And this will be in a collecting duct. We'll come down here as well. There we go. So this is collecting duct. So that's carrying almost the final filtrate will run through the collecting duct. Once it leaves the collecting duct, it's urine. You're not gonna do much of anything else with it. This is the distal convoluted tubule. Oops, sorry, that's a P, it's proximal. This is the distal convoluted tubule. And this big hairpin loop here, or loop of the nephron, I usually refer to it as the loop of Henley. Now, as I mentioned earlier, only about 20% of nephrons have this big, long loop of Henley. And remember, right about here, this is cortex. This is medulla underneath. So the only things really in the medulla are that long loop of Henley and the collecting duct. In fact, we didn't get to look at it in lab, but if you look at even a, a fresh or a preserved kidney and you section it, the, those medullary pyramids, they look very striated, very linear. That's because it's made up of a bunch of these sort of parallel running tubes. It has a completely different sort of texture than the cortex, which looks a little bit more like hamburger meat, kind of granular. Now, what the loop of Henley does. All right. The tricky part of producing urine is producing a hypertonic urine. That is urine that's more concentrated than your blood. Producing isotonic urine is pretty easy, but hyper, hy hypertonic is a little trickier. This is what the loop of Henley is for. Now, what happens if you go from the medulla, right where it meets the cortex, and you move down, and let's say the papillae is right here somewhere. Remember, it's like that little apex of the pyramid. As you move from the cortex down through the medulla to the papillae, you'll notice if you sample the extracellular fluid, it starts to get more and more concentrated. Again, the concentration of your blood and most of the Interstitial fluid or extracellular fluid is about 300 milliosmoles. Osmoles are similar to moles, except they're not number of molecules per liter, they're number of particles. So ions count as well. So just to give you baseline, 300 milliosmoles, that's your blood. Distilled water, about 40 milliosmoles. Salt water out of the ocean might be about 1400 milliosmoles, so that kind of gives you a range. And if you sample the interstitial fluid as you go down, what you'll find is it starts at 300.
And as you go from the cortex towards the papillae of the pyramid, that extracellular fluid gets more and more concentrated. It goes from about 300 milliosmoles up to about 1,200 milliosmoles, which is about four times more concentrated than your blood. It's salty. Now, as you'll see, that concentration gradient as you go through the medulla, from kind of its base towards the papillae, that's what allows you to produce a concentrated urine. So how do we set this up? Because most other fluids in your body, you're not going to find this high concentration in the interstitial fluid. It's kind of unique to this part of the kidney. And the way it works, more or less, the filtrate coming into the loop of Hadley is isotonic with the blood. It's about 300 milliosmoles. But as it travels down what they call the descending limb of the loop of Hadley, the descending limb of the loop of Hadley is traveling through this pyramid. And out here, the concentration in this interstitial fluid is getting higher and higher. It's hypertonic. What's that gonna do? Well, as the filtrate moves down, a little bit of water might move out, but what you're getting is salts like sodium and chloride moving in. Everything's going to be diffusing. The descending limb of the, the, the loop of Hadley is fairly permeable. Ions can move through, water can move through. So as you follow this fluid as you go down, by the time you reach this 180 degree turn here, the fluid in this furthest, this deepest portion of the loop of Hadley, it's going to get, you know, reaches equilibrium with this extracellular fluid. It's about 1200 milliosmoles, very salty. No big deal yet. You know, that's just diffusion. Now, what's interesting, the ascending limb of the loop of Hadley, it's actually a little bit thicker. The cells are thicker, they're cuboidal rather than squamous. They have some unique permeability characteristics. The ascending limb of the loop of Hadley, these cells are set up so they do not have a significant number of aquaporins. If you remember, maybe from last semester, most cells have some specialized proteins in their membrane that make them very permeable to water. Those proteins are called aquaporins. They're lacking here. So while in most cells, if you pump sodium by active transport water, it's just gonna follow by osmosis. That will not happen in the ascending limb of the loop of Hadley. As this concentrated fluid comes, starts moving up to 100 milliosmoles, what you have in the ascending limb are a bunch of active transport pumps, mainly sodium pumps. They are going to actively transport sodium from the filtrate, because of course a lot of it's moved into the filtrate here, 1200 milliosmoles, a lot of that concentration is sodium chloride and other uh, common ions. So we're going to pump out sodium. Now normally, and in other parts of the nephron, if you move sodium, water is going to follow by osmosis. That can't happen here because this part of the loop of Henley is impermeable to water. So as this filtrate moves up, what you're doing is you're removing the salt. Sodium is pumped out. Chloride tends to follow because of its electrical attraction. So as this fluid moves up the ascending limb, by the time you reach the top, it's about 100 milliosmoles. That is, the stuff coming in is 300 milliosmoles. What's leaving is more dilute. Let's say it's about 100 milliosmoles. Where'd the salt go? That's moved out here. That's what sets up this concentration rate. It's a loop of Henley. As the fluid moves through the loop of Henley, you're basically taking the salts, pumping them out, the water can't follow, and they accumulate out here in the medulla. We don't have a concentrated filtrator urine yet. 100 milliosmoles, you know, we're getting pretty water here. That's pretty dilute. That will go on through the distal convoluted tubule. It may get, move up a little bit and may lose a little water, 300 milliosmoles. That's going to enter the collecting duct. Now, one thing to note about the collecting duct, it also moves through the medulla from the base here to the papillae. It's moving through the same high concentration environment. As it does that, of course, we can kind of manipulate the water in the collecting duct. Now, here's what's cool about the collecting duct. The collecting duct has variable permeability. Depending on sort of physiological conditions, the collecting duct might be permeable to water or it might not. So this filtrate coming in here, it's fairly dilute. Now, I'm gonna say 300 milliosmoles. It's gonna go down through the collecting duct and it's gonna exit into that mitre calyx and end up being the urine. Now let's say 
you are overhydrated. You're already kind of a little bit dilute in the blood department. If you have excess water or sufficient water, you don't want to put any more water back into your blood. So what happens if you have you know, lots of water, lots of H2O in the blood, you don't want to take any more. And so the walls of the collecting duct are impermeable. If they're impermeable, as this fluid moves through, none of the water can diffuse out because the walls of the collecting duct are impermeable to water. There may be some additional active transport, so you may actually even pump additional sodium out. And so if the walls of the collecting duct <coughs> are impermeable to water, by the time the, the filtrate, which is going to be urine, reaches the end of the collecting duct, it might be at about 50 milliosmoles. That's not much more concentrated than tap water. There's not a lot of dissolved stuff in there. It's mostly water. And you know this, if you're overhydrated, you urinate a lot. What's it look like? Water. Why? Because it's mostly water. So you'll flush out large volumes of fairly dilute urine. It still has waste in it, but it's really dilute. On the other hand, what if you're dehydrated? You haven't been drinking enough water, and you're always going to be losing water. Every time you breathe, you lose some water vapor. There's some you know, water loss to the skin, even if you're not sweating, you're always losing some water. And if you get a little bit dehydrated, you don't lose any more. So if that's the case, the walls of this collecting duct can switch. If the walls of the collecting duct become impermeable, or sorry, become permeable to water. So impermeable, the, wall, the fluid, the filtrate comes through, you pump out some additional sodium, it's very dilute. If the walls of this collecting duct become permeable to water, what's going to happen? Well, as the fluid moves through, just like in the descending limb of the loop of Henle, water will move out by osmosis. And by the time you reach the end of the collecting duct, you'll be at about 1,200 milliosmoles about the same concentration as the interstitial fluid in Abdul. That's your max concentration. You can't exceed the concentration of salt in that interstitial fluid in medulla. So if the wall of collecting duct is impermeable, you can't reabsorb the water, you will remove a little bit more salt, dilute urine. If the walls of the collecting duct are permeable to water, the water moves out by osmosis, and what's left in the, in the collecting duct becomes very concentrated, 1,200 milliosmoles, getting close to seawater, not quite there. That's why you can't drink seawater, but it's close. So the idea is the collecting duct has variable permeability. It can be permeable to water, pull the water out of the filtrate, produce a concentrated urine, put that water back into blood, or produce a very dilute urine. If they're impermeable, no water comes out. It's a dilute urine. You flush out excess water. Now, the question is, what changes the permeability characteristics of the collecting duct? And it turns out you already know that. We already did it. What's the function of antidiuretic hormone? It's a water conservation hormone. This is its target. You know, earlier in the semester, we just said ADH targets a kidney. This is kind of what it targets. If you are dehydrated, you will secrete antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone is what causes aquaporins to be placed into the cells lining the collecting duct. You reabsorb the water into the blood, the urine is concentrated. If you're overhydrated, you stop releasing antidiuretic hormone and it's cleared from the blood fairly quickly with no ADH. The walls of the collecting duct become impermeable to water, and that's when you produce a dilute urine. So that's the function of the loop of Henle. The reason only about 20% of the nephrons have this big loop of Henle is you don't need that many. The other nephrons, what they call cortical nephrons, they're still draining their fluid in the collecting duct, and it'll still be concentrated. You only need enough loops of Henle to set up this concentration gradient in the extracellular fluid in the, in the renal pyramid, and you're good to go. All right, so that's... And all I'm going to do with the loop of Henle, let me look at the juxtaglomerular apparatus. I'll use a small screen for that. All right, let me go over the juxtaglomerular apparatus a bit. What you're seeing here, this is a Bowman's capsule, glomerulus, afferent arterial, efferent arterial, and this is kind of the end of the loop of Henle and the distal convoluted tubule right here. A couple of specialized groups of cells. Uh, first of all, there are some granular cells wrapped around mostly the afferent arterial, a few around the efferent. 
These are connected or innervated by sympathetic nerves. Now, what happens with these? If your systemic blood pressure drops, the baroreceptors in the aorta and the carotid sinuses will pick that up. The brain will send an impulse down these sympathetic nerve fibers, and that will cause these cells to secrete renin. So this is mostly to control for systemic blood pressure. If it gets too low, the renin, which I think we've already talked about, is released from these cells, and it causes the formation of angiotensin 1, which will travel to the lungs, get converted to angiotensin 2, which is a powerful vasoconstrictor systemically. So it will cause most of your arterioles to constrict to up blood pressure. It'll also cause the release of aldosterone, which also helps to retain fluid, increase blood volume, and increase blood pressure. So that's one thing you've got in the juxtaglomerular apparatus. The other thing that can happen here is the if the filtration rate is very high, that is your blood pressure is too high, you're getting a lot of uh, blood moving to glomerulus, a lot of filtrate being formed. As the filtrate moves through the loop of Henle in this distal convoluted tubule, these macula densa cells can pick up the salt concentration. If it's too high, these macula densa cells will secrete ATP, you know, adenosine triphosphate. That gets converted by these mesangial cells into adenosine. Remember, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. Just chop off the phosphate until you have adenosine. That acts as a signal, uh, kind of a paracrine or local hormone and it will cause these granular cells to constrict, which will reduce blood pressure and flow through the glomerulus to drop the filtration rate back down. I think there's yeah, not much else I wanna talk about with this. So that's it, good luck with everything. Again, I'll have a, the last exam posted on uh, tomorrow or Friday and try and get everything wrapped up so I can get your final grades done. Take care.